All right. Um, the next lecture is kind of fun. You'll like it. Okay. So, what combination of the following numbers equal 113? Does anyone know? Help me figure that out. Come on, it's not that hard of math. 5, 7, 15, 32, 69. No, it's not all of them. Trust me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. It's too easy. Okay, what numbers is it? Do the math. Come on. 5, 15, 32. Need more than that? Well, what combination is that? If something gets online, you can unmute your microphone and tell us. But it's. Uh... What is it? Uh, it's 5, 7, 32, 69. 5, 7, 32, and 69. Okay, let's see. So 32 and 69 is 90. That's 111. 8 is uh, 118. And 5 is 108, uh, then 113. So, yeah, that's good. So it's 5, 7, 32, and 69. Are we okay with that? See how we did that? That's the merkel knapsack. That's it. If you can do that, you got it solved. Okay? So that's... So are we okay on how to do this then? Should we skip the rest of this lecture and just move on to the next one? Probably not. Okay. Well, again, this is how the merkel, -Nap merkel helmet knapsack works, and we are going to cover it in depth. All right. So there were a couple of different types of problems, and I can guarantee you positively these three types of problems, or at least one of them, will be on the test. Okay? I usually pick one type of problem and put it on there. So you just never, never know which one it is. All right, so a P problem. Let's talk about some different types of problems. It's a set of problems whose solution, solutions run in time bounded by polynomial functions of the size of the problem. Basically, they're simple. Simple to solve. Can be solved what's called polynomial time, which is the amount of time that's roughly proportional to the size of the problem. Example: multiplying two numbers together, like five times four. Pretty simple problem. Problem small, very simple. Okay, but how about searching for a, a book from a box of books? Is that a hard problem? No. It's basically grabbing a book out of a box. Nope, that's not it. Putting it down, grab the next one. So it's not a hard problem at all. But it could take you the rest of your life. Imagine if you went to the Library of Congress searching for a specific book when they weren't organized. It's not hard. It could just take you forever. All right, somebody mute your microphone, whoever's sawing wood. <laughs> all right. All right, so are we okay on what a P problem? It's an easy problem but it's bounded by polynomial time of the size of the problem. Okay? So it's something we can definitely do. It just might take us forever. Are we okay on P problems? Okay? All right. Let's go to NP. It stands for non-deterministic polynomial. It says the problems whose solutions run in time polynomial, bounded by polynomial functions. Man, I can't talk tonight. Of the size of the problem, assuming the ability to guess perfectly. All right. Now I put some definitions in here. It stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, where non-deterministic is a fancy way of talking about guessing a solution. So if I can guess a solution, and it works, we're good to go. It's NP if you can quickly test whether the solution is correct. Have you ever taken an algebra problem, taking the answer and tested it? Pretty simple to do. That would be NP. Okay. So, as long as we can guess or test the solution without worrying about how hard it is to find it, okay, so the problems in MP are still relatively easy as long as you can guess the right answer. So, it's basically with algebra. If I could guess the right answer, we are good to go, okay? So, a problem is NP complete if we can verify it quickly. We can guess it and then verify it. In other words, a quick algorithm can be used to make sure that it is actually correct, okay? And once we know that algorithm, we can use it to solve all the rest. Okay? So it's a problem where we can guess the answer, kind of like you guys just did at the beginning. Didn't we just guess which numbers to use? And then we came up with a, there was actually an algorithm, which, believe it or not, we all used one. We did, you know, five, we did whatever numbers we picked times each other, then you know, added them all up. So 
There was an algorithm behind that, and that's actually what the merkel hellman knapsack, knapsack is. But it's complete if we can verify it. If we can make that algorithm, we can test it, and it works. Okay? So we've got a P problem, very simple. Might take you forever, but very simple. NP problems are tougher. They're non-deterministic polynomials. But problems that we can, if we can guess the answer, if we can test it to see if it's, that it's correct, then they're NP complete if we can take that answer, come up with an algorithm to use, and actually verify that it's correct from that point on. Okay? With me so far? All right. So they're getting tougher. Now, EXP, set of problems whose solutions run in time bounded by exponential functions of the size of the problem. All right. Y'all know what an exponent is? Like 2 to the third power is 8. <laughs> so, so it's 2 times 2 times 2. Okay? Uh, I used to assign a, a problem where I'd ask you know, my students who have to write something. Would you rather have a million dollars or a penny a day doubled every day for 30 days? Which would you rather have? Because that's a $30 million. Was it? No, it's $10 million in 30 days, isn't it? It's either 10 or 30, I forget now, but... The point is, exponential problems get exponentially harder. Okay? And as we start talking about some of these other problems, you'll see that exponents are used massively in all of these because it makes them much harder. Okay? We don't want something simple. Okay? So with me? EXP are problems bounded in time, bounded by exponential functions of the size of the problem. The bigger exponent, obviously the harder the problem. All you really need to know is those, those basic definitions I just said. Okay? One of them will be on the test. Okay? Now, the fundamental result. Let's talk about this. All right. First of all, that symbol is subset of or equal to. So it says P is a subset of NP, which is a subset of EXP. In other words, could a P problem be an NP problem? Could that also be an EXP problem? It actually could be. But we can't guarantee they can be that way. Okay? Cannot guarantee that they're always equal. Okay? It's not going to be untested, just the way it is. All right. Now let's look at some of these comments. As NP complete problems do not guarantee that there's no solution easier than exponential. So we might be able to guess if a problem is correct, test it, and write an algorithm, which is NP complete. But could that algorithm still require exponential work? Yeah, so an NP could actually be EXP as well. Okay? It says every NP problem has a solution that runs in time proportional to 2 to the N. In other words, again, it could take quite a while to do. Okay? And non deterministic can be modeled by threads. What? They don't know what a thread is? A thread is when you can do multiple things at one time. Okay? Like, so we have, you know, multiple threading machines and, you know, just. Uh, so, basically, they can be modeled by threads. Interceptors can use any other information to simplify the task or break the encryption. What does that mean? It could use anything. I mean, a lot of times they use other stuff, like like breaking passwords. If you're going to break passwords, what would you probably start with? Dictionary. Start with a dictionary. Start with something you know about people. Don't we all, in one form or another, use some prior knowledge of something to make our passwords? Is there anyone here that uses truly randomly generated product passwords? We can't, because we can't remember the darn thing. That's what I thought was thinking is funny about OSU system. When you go to change your password, they always recommend these passwords to you. But they are the most bizarre passwords in the world. It's like, why? I mean, you would be forced to write them down. Now, when I was in the military, I had to use certain passwords all the time. We had a system called CAMS, where they required us to, you know, they hard-coded a password for each person and gave it to you. You had no choice. But I entered it like 800 times a day. So you got to the point where after a few days I remembered it. But normally you don't use passwords like that. It's not very smart. Okay? All right. Let's move on. All right. Hard problems. Okay. So some problems are hard to solve. you all agree with that? Yeah, there's always something that's hard to solve. Okay? Some of you probably think Kaziski was hard to solve. It really wasn't. Okay? It says, there could be no polynomial time algorithm is known. Okay? An example would be NP or hard problems which is, such as machine scheduling, bin packing, or the knapsack, which we're going to actually cover. 
So the knapsack is considered a hard problem. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Is having a hard problem bad? What do you think? Well, if you're using something for encryption, wouldn't you want a hard problem? Heck yes, I would want some. I mean, I would hate for, like, remember WEP, Wired Equivalency Protocol? Originally, that thing was supposed to be the best protocol in the world. So it's supposed to make wireless just as secure as wired, but did it turn out that way? No. No, I think that you can now break WEP in four to five seconds using a bunch of different tools. So obviously, the program that we thought was hard wasn't really hard. Okay. <coughs> All right. It says data encryption relies on problems or difficult to solve problems. Okay. We want something that's hard. We don't want something that undoes itself automatically. Okay. All right. Secure encryption systems. Okay. So modern things are based on hard problems and NP complete problems. In other words, we can come up with an algorithm. We can, you know, if we guess the answer, we can test it. So we can come up with an algorithm to solve it. So modern ones are always based on hard problems. Involves heuristic searches. Okay. In other words, it could be quite a few possibilities to try to get these to work. And with some of them could be an excessive amount of tries. Okay. Usually works, but not always. So, but you want to break some paths where you could you could literally sit there and keep trying everything until you get something that works. Okay. All right. Let's talk about some of the public key encryption systems. Okay. All right. Is public key symmetric or asymmetric? Asymmetric. Symmetric is same key. So the same key S same for encrypting your decrypt. Public key is obviously a different key. One's public, one's private. So since it's not the same, it's asymmetric. Okay. Diffie Hellman's one. We're going to cover that one in great depth. We're going to be talking about the Merkel Hellman knapsack today and also next Monday. Okay. RSA, still used today, by the way. Okay. That was 72. It was originally in 72, but okay. <coughs> RSA. El Gamal will probably not cover that, but we might. I was thinking about possibly covering that one this time. And hashing algorithms. Okay? It's another public encryption system. Okay? So a couple different ones there. Okay? Now, let's talk about satisfiability for a second. All right, so I want you to pick a combination of V1, 2, and 3 such that... V and V2 or V3 and not V3 <coughs> or not V1 is true. Okay. So in other words, which combination of those, V1, 2, and 3, what are the values, true or false? Help me figure that out. Okay, the and symbol is the double thing I can't draw. Okay, and the, the lines is the or symbol. That line that points down, that's the not symbol. All right. So, if you know anything about Boolean algebra, and, so if something's and, what is it, true on both sides, false on both sides, or what? True on both sides. True on both sides. So, one and two, they both have to be true. So, for this to be true, does V1 have to be true or false to start with? True. V1 has to be true. Y'all see that? And since V1 has to be true, because it's on the left side of an and, so for our whole statement to be true, V1 has to be true. And since the third statement, or not V1, and if V1 was true, so not V1 is false, so then not V3 needs to be what? So what does V3 need to be? False. It needs to be false, so that not V3 becomes true. So now we know V1 is true, V3 is true. What's V2 then? Not true. False? Okay, let's test it. So V1 is true. Obviously we're good there. So V2 is false. V3 is true. So is, is the middle one good? False or true? That's good. Let's check the one on the right. Not true. Is that what we said? And we said V3 was false, didn't we? Okay. V3 is true. We said V3 was true? Okay. So not true would be false on the left, <clears throat> and not true would be false on the right. So the last one doesn't work. 
I don't have my pen unless I draw on the board. All right, for those of you at home, you can just get to guess what I'm writing on the board. All right, we got a problem. I don't know what the eraser is. So V1 we know is true. Okay? So we're saying that V2 is what again? False. And we're saying V3 is what? True. Is true. All right, so we got true and false or true. So false or true, which is good. So that's okay. That one's good. That one's good. And V3, so it'll be false or false. Is that right? That doesn't work. So one of our values is wrong. Which one's wrong? V3 or V2? Both. Okay, let's try both. So we'll change V2 to true, V3 to false then. Alright, so, so the middle one is now going to be true Get rid of this. or false. So the middle one's good now. And the right hand side will be not false. So we get true or false. So is that better? There you go. So it's V1 is true, V2 is true, and V3 is false. Everybody see that? The point is there's only one combination there that works. Okay? Alright. That's how the knapsack works. When we did that thing on the first slide, remember we had to pick the combination of those numbers? There's only one combination that worked. That 5, 7, 32, and 69. Remember that? Remember there's only one combination of those numbers that actually worked? Okay? So with a knapsack, let's talk about how that works. Pick V1 and V1, 2, and 3, okay, from the subset of 0 and 1, okay? So for V1, 2, and 3, we only got two choices, 0 and 1. So it's true or false, basically. Such that V1 times A1 plus V2 times A2 plus V3 times A3 is equal to the target sum. All right. Let's, let me replace those. Replace... Uh, a1 with 5, A2 with 7, A3 with whatever the other one was, 17 was it? 15. Okay. 15. Then we would need A3 and A4. But my point is here. What happens when you multiply a number times 0? You do 0. What happens when, what happens when you multiply a number times 1? You get that number. So if I was to go back a couple slides, here. So, that formula we just saw. So, pick the numbers from the choice of 0 and 1 so that each number times that number all adds up to 113. So, what number times 5 would we need to use? 1. one. What number times 7? One. 1. What number times 15? Zero. 0. What number times 32? One. 1. What number times 69? Zero. 1. <laughs> equals 113. Did you all see what we just did? Because we're, we're going to be multiplying these numbers times either 1 or 0. And the only way to get rid of the 15 is multiply it times 0. That's exactly how the knapsack works. Okay? Okay? So far, so good? Okay. So you just have to figure out the combination of those numbers multiplying times either 0 or 1 so the sum equals what you want it to. And you will have to do an assignment on this. I've had them write Java programs on this in the past. I won't this time, though. I'm going to change it up a little. I knew you'd appreciate that, Dustin. Just for you, Dustin. Just for you. All right. So let's talk about some secret and public key, uh, key encryption systems. All right. Symmetric, remember that? It's the same key for encryption and decryption. Remember that? So the encryption key is equal to the decryption key. It's equal to the key. There's only one key. Okay. So if we encrypt something with a key, that gives the ciphertext. And if we take that ciphertext and decrypt it with the same key, we get the plain text again. Okay. One key per channel. So the number of keys is n times n minus one divided by two. Seen all this before? Everybody okay with that? 
Nothing new here at all? You're going to see this on a test. I think I've already told you that, didn't I? Okay. Asymmetric now, the keys are different. Encryption and decryption are different. A separate key for encryption and a separate key for decryption. So if we encrypt our plain text with the encryption key, we get ciphertext. Then we encrypt the ciphertext with the decryption key, we get our plain text back again. Okay? So for each, there's two. Two times n. Okay? So, okay, we got five. Let's say we got five people. How many keys do we need for symmetric, and how many do we need for asymmetric with five people? What do you think? One key for symmetric. What? Uh, well, no, I mean, there's, okay, five people, they all want to talk to each other, but not all together. You know what I mean? I want to talk to Dustin, I want to talk to Chris, I want to talk to Linda, I want to talk to you. All right, so if there's five people, so two times n is ten. So for, for asymmetric, it's ten. It's very simple. Because every two people needs one key. Now, uh, what about symmetric now? So, according to our algorithm, 5 times 4 is what? 20 divided by 2 is 10. Everybody okay know how to do that? All right. Make sure you know how to do that. Let me see that again. All right. Public key, and we're just seeing it a little bit different way. Asymmetric again. So we have a key pair. We have a public and a private key pair. They work together. Okay, they won't work apart. Now, does it really matter which key is public, which key is private? No, as long as you keep them private. Right. It really doesn't matter. As long as whatever you decide stays that way. So if you decide that one key is private, it needs to be private from then on, forever. What happens if you decide to switch it six months later? You better come with a new key. You can come up with a whole new key. Because if six months later I decide, okay, I'm going to swap them, my private key will not become my public, and my public will not become my private. What happens to those of you who've downloaded my public key in the last six months? Well, now I'm giving you the answer to it. So it needs to stay that way forever. Okay? So the private key is private. The public key is obviously public. Okay? The private key is kept secret by A. The public key is distributed widely. Put on the Internet. Okay? So, A to receiver, we encrypt our plain text with our private key, get our ciphertext, and they basically use the public key to get it back again. Okay? And the sender can do the opposite. If you want to send me something, you just encrypt it with my public key. Okay, well, let's stop with that for one, for one second here. So if I put my public key on the Internet for the whole world to see, okay, and we got Dustin over here. Dustin downloads my public key. He encrypts something with it and sends it to me. What good did that do? What can I, I mean, what do you think? I have the private key, so I can open it. Am I the only one that can open it? Right. So what, what good did that do? Well, maybe so that I'm the only one who can open it. But do I know who it came from? You can validate the sender. Can I validate the sender? Not unless he encrypts it with his key as well. The way PGP normally works, Dustin could encrypt something with my public key and just send it to me. I wouldn't have a clue who it came from. Because everybody has my public key. But if Dustin encrypts it with my public key and signs it with his private key, when I receive it, obviously I have the private key for mine to open it up. But then since I can download the public key, I can say, aha, the answer to that private key that was encrypted with is only Dustin's. So I can, it's called encrypting and signing. So you need them both ways to verify it. Okay? Just him encrypting with my public key is like, okay, I'm the only one that can open it, but I still don't know who it came from. I do an assignment in another class where I have the students actually encrypt something. Don't put a name on it. And when I open it up, I can tell exactly where it came from based on your key, as long as you don't mess up your key. So many people mess up the key. I messed up my key last semester. First time in 10 years I messed up my key. I'm like, what the heck did I do? But I had to redo my key, which sucks. It's like, I can't believe I did that. So, that's all right. 
This guy messed up in forensics this semester twice on this one project. Is anyone in forensic? Yes. Yeah, I kept oh, telling you about tips. the TIFFs. There was no TIFFs yeah. in there. And go with PMGs. Yeah, and, and I just knew for sure I put them in there. Like, why can't you find the TIFFs? Well, it's because I didn't put them in there. That's probably why. But there was actually two TIFFs, by the way. But they were embedded from another document is why. But All right. The documents was hard enough. Yes. Did you get them all? I got two so far. You're getting there. Yeah, a couple more days. All right. Merkel Hellman. Let's talk about Merkel Hellman. Every time I hear this, you know what I think of? Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, exactly. <laughs> you ever use Hellman's mayonnaise? The best in the world. It's no, best foods is. Mayonnaise, uh, can't get Miracle up. Be we don't, do we even have a Best Foods here? Best Foods is the same things as Hellman's, it's just on the West Coast. Ah, look at that. Hellman's. I grew up with. And we came here and I'm like, it looks similar, but the name is different. Dave, if you ever want to make a really good sandwich, first of all, you've got to use toast there. with Hellman's mayonnaise. But make a baking, cucumber or baking lettuce and tomato, but put cucumbers instead of lettuce. A thousand times better. Thousand, at least maybe twenty thousand times better. Is it, is it the Not bacon that makes it taste so good? No, it's the cucumbers. Sure. Make sure you peel them. I, I hate unpeeled cucumbers. But uh, yeah, Hellman's mayonnaise. It's best. Okay, the way it works is it encodes a binary message as a solution to the knapsack problem. Okay, what would a binary message mean? Ones and zeros. Ones and zeros. So can I encrypt the word Ken? Yes. I can as long as I can read the binary. I can't just encrypt Ken. So for this to work, you're going to have to have a binary message, okay? It's an NP-complete problem, okay? Now, we're going to start talking about something called the simple knapsack, okay? Linear time, hard knapsack is exponential time. Simple knapsack is quite simple, which we're going to go over, okay? Your hard knapsack is quite hard, hence the name. We're going to talk about each one of these works. Now, what type of encryption do you think Merkel <coughs> Hellman is? It's a one-way encryption. So when you see this on a test, is it one way or two way? I will bet you that is the most missed question. So many people get that wrong. It's like, it's one-way encryption. So even though sometimes it'll undo it, but most of the time it won't. It's one-way encryption. Okay. So don't miss that one. So everybody okay? Let's, let's try that one again. Is it a one-way or two-way encryption? Two-way. Right. Very good. <laughs> One way encryption. All right. All right, let's talk about the general knapsack. It says, given S and a target sum T, find V out of the set set of 0, 1 such that the sum of all those of A times V is equal to T. All right, what the heck did I just say? Given a simple knapsack of however many values, in a sum, find V from 0 and 1, so that when the simple knapsack components are multiplied times 0 and 1, you get the target. Okay? So if the simple knapsack is 9, 5, 2, and 13, and the target is 24, so what combination of 9, 5, 2, and 13 do you need? Well, obviously V has to be a 1, and a 0, and a 1, and a 1, because 9 times 1, plus 5 times 0, plus 2 times 1, plus 13 times 1, give us 24. Just like we did on that first page. Everybody with me? It's quite critical you get this. This encryption technique is about 8 steps. And you need to know all of them. Okay, you need to know all of them. Okay? This is an NP-complete problem. That, okay, let's talk about what NP complete again. It's a problem that we can guess the solution, test that it works, and come up with an algorithm. Okay? So it's NP complete as long as we can guess what V is. Did we just guess what V is right there? <clears throat> I mean, it was already on the slide. But didn't on that first slide of the thing you guys guess which combination of those numbers? And you could test it, you could add them up until you get to 113. Same way here. If I had told you what V was, could you have figured out it's 1011? Yeah, because I mean, there's not that many numbers there. All right. So far, so good? Everybody with me? Right. <clears throat> we need to have what's called a super-increasing knapsack. 
Okay. All right. So each element in the simple knapsack satisfies the condition so that such that a k is greater than, in other words, in English, every element in the knapsack has to be greater than the sum of all the prior digits in the knapsack. Okay. So is two bigger than one? Yes. Yes. Is five bigger than two plus one? Yes. Okay. Is 13 bigger than 5 plus 2 plus 1? Yes. That's what all that means. Okay. Any idea why that's important? So there's no repeating? Well, not necessarily no repeating. That's close. But the point is we, don't want, we only want one combination to work. Is there any other way that we could get this to work? Oh, this one's not super increasing, by the way. But is there any other combination of numbers to get that to work? I mean, of the 9, 5, 2, and 13, oh, is there oh, any other way we could have done it? No, no. There isn't. And that's the way you want this to work. It's like you don't want two keys that undoes your encryption. Okay? So the point of a super-increasing knapsack is you only want one key to work. And if you have a non-super-increasing knapsack, which I will give you an example of next class period, you will see that there's more than one answer. Or you'll be decrypting it and you'll be like, okay, the answer is either 2 or 5. What good would that be? I mean, that, that would suck if there was two answers to the thing. Okay? So, super increasing is long that each value is greater than the sum of all the par prior values. Okay? And there's the symbol. I, I have the hardest time reading those. That's why you guys are in discrete math, so I don't have to remember how to do it. <laughs>